Jesus uh, warned us uh, what to expect uh, prior to his return uh, in, uh, in the Gospels. Uh, and in the book of Mark, uh, we have a summary of some of Jesus' statements concerning the future. Uh, and this is what Jesus says in Mark 13, verse 9. Uh, he says, as you approach the end of time before he brings the kingdom and brings the tribulation, uh, he tells you, anticipate this. He says, but watch out for yourselves, for they will deliver you uh, up uh, to councils, uh, which is like uh, they'll bring you to court, uh, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all the nations. But when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate on what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated, uh, not because of who you are, but because of Christ, your name related to Christ. Uh, we live in the times uh, that Jesus has talked about uh, as uh, people are pitted against one another. In fact, we can see in the political environment in which we live uh, deep divisions between families over politics, right? Uh, you just let it be brought up who you're voting for, and that can create a, a, a hostile family environment, as many of you have told me and I've experienced myself. We live in those, those times when uh, there's a division between peoples, uh, uh, over uh, ideologies, over worldviews, over the way that you should live according to them. Um, and so I wanna, I, I'm not even going to go through all the, the persecution things that go on in our country from a football coach who, whose players want him uh, to pray for them, uh, and he does before and after the game, and then he gets in trouble with the ACLU for actually praying for his young man. I, I would put to you, we need more coaches who pray for their young man. But that's the world in which we live. Uh, it's a world uh, full of uh, reversals, as we've been talking about in Psalm 37. Uh, another story about a young woman on college, a brave young college student, uh, just had a cross on her, uh, uh, on her neck one day, uh, and she was asked to remove that because it was offensive. Uh, but then at the same school, you could uh, have a Muslim prayer room. That was okay, but a Christian couldn't wear a cross on a campus. I would say that a Christian young lady should be fearless in wearing her cross because that's the answer to the problems that we have as a nation. So this is what uh, Jesus talked about, that you, when you get toward the end, uh, light replaces, uh, or darkness replaces light. Uh, logical reasoning uh, is thrown to the wind and place, uh, replaced by that which is illogical. Uh, error replaces truth. And I used to wonder when I was younger, how in the world, as you approach uh, the final judgment of mankind, will you get highly educated, thinking people to throw all these things to the wind? Well, we now see how that is possible because they are doing it left and right. So uh, David was a man who lived in turbulent times. Um, many opposed him. They wanted to overthrow his rule as the king. Uh, he had personal issues as well. No leader is perfect, are they? You know this, right? You cannot vote in a perfect leader. David was far from a perfect man, as we're going to see. But he was a godly man. He was a man after God's own heart. And he sits down later in life, and he reflects on uh, how a Christian should live in a, in a tumultuous time. What should you do? Uh, and he answers that in, a, in a real extreme, uh, very practical ways for you to understand in Psalm 37. He tells you what you should do as your society goes south. And a lot of people think that this is some of the wisdom that he gave his son Solomon to set his son down to say, son, this is what I, as your dad, have learned about being a godly man, about being a godly father, about being a politician. This is what I've learned, and I'm going to put it in this psalm. And he made it a song for all of the nation to sing when they came to worship. But he probably taught it to his son. What did he teach him? Well, let's review since it's been two weeks since I was here, uh, and we may have forgotten uh, what we talked about. So let's review. What did he, what's he taught us so far? Psalm 37, 1 and 2. He said, and it's a long and short view because David's going to look down the hall of time eschatologically, prophetically, and say, because we as Christians know that the king is coming. Jesus is coming back. We, we know who wins at the end of the day. That's the future. We need to focus on that occasionally and let that impact our present. So in light of that, he says, in this tension between the future and the present, which I call the long and the short, he says, don't get all uptight about that which is temporary. And the word uptight, I've told you in Hebrew, is the word to get angry. Don't get mad. Don't yell. Don't scream, etc. Don't pound your fist. He says, uh, don't get all uptight. God's got it. Number two, verses three to seven. 
uh, as you look at between the long view and the short view of time, he says, Don't be, do, do live sold out to God. That your life, everything about it, is, is focused on Christ. Every, whether, whether you're a student, car mechanic, bank teller, whatever it is that you do, your life permeates with, with the character of Christ. Number three, uh, verses 7b through 20, that long section, he tells us there, don't be undone by the winds of the wicked. Why? The great reversal is coming. That one day Christ returns and he reverses all that you see today. The evil that exists and is pervasive, especially as he'll talk about in this passage, will one day uh, meet its end when Jesus appears and righteousness reigns. Point four is what we're going to look at today, verses 21 to 40. This is somewhat of a miraculous action to cover verses 21 to 40 in the next 30 minutes. Are you with me? We're going to do it. We're going to do it because it, there's some meat here. And what, is it, what he teaches us here is most amazing. He's going to teach three concepts in this final point. He's going to say that in, in very testy times, in wicked days, you should do this with your mind. Uh, realize or focus on these three things, that you as a Christian have a divine promise, you have divine provision, and you have divine protection. You have what? You have a... I'm, I'm giving you an opportunity to speak. It's okay. You have a promise from God. Promises. You have provision from God. He's always going to provide for you, no matter how stark the day. And number three, uh, you're going to always have his protection, no matter how dark the day is. He's going to vacillate um, around these things. Uh, we have, uh, I went and voted the other day in a line that went, uh, I don't know, I think it went all the way down to South Carolina. Um, I, I went early, because uh, I figured on election day, there's going to be a lot of people in line. Uh, and it was, it was interesting, uh, and I'm glad I voted, uh, and, and, because it was a little faster than it probably will be. But when you think about the outcome of the presidential election, what are they telling us? That basically, either way that it goes, it's going to be bad news. Rioting the streets, you won't be able to get to the grocery store, societal meltdown, constitution thrown to the wind. I mean, all the things that are telling us. So people are living in fear, are they not? Maybe it's you. And when you think about the world in which we live, it has sunk to new lows. But as you look at the world in which we live, you should not be uh, uh, upset, uh, fearful, because what we have here is divine promise that God will be with you, divine pr protection and provision that he will provide no matter what happens. He's going to be with you. So um, we're going to pour through these verses. I won't say we're going to exegete every single one of them. That would take forever. We're going to cover just the movement of the passage as he vacillates between those three things. So when evil successes and advancement seem unstoppable, and sometimes they do, they seem unstoppable. Uh, when evil people seem to be impervious to facts, that facts absolutely don't matter, we'll just ignore them and proceed on our evil way. When you live in that kind of world uh, that has the immoral pedal to the metal uh, and doing whatever they want, and it seems like they're doing it just in an unchecked fashion, the, the Christian can be tempted to, well, be afraid uh, uh, for, for what's, what they're seeing, feel hopeless, and maybe feel like you want to just throw in the towel. I mean, they, they just seem to progressing and no one's stopping them. And Jesus says, oh, or David says, just wait, wait a minute. Don't throw in the towel. Focus on those three things. So what do you have? We'll review. You have what? Three things. Promise, Promise provision, and protection at all times from God Almighty. So uh, David, before he looks at the prophetic future, he's going to stop in verse 21. Uh, and he's going to look at um, the present. What is what is God focusing on. God focuses on the character of a man. He focuses on your character, on who you are. Uh, I would say that uh, character is in short supply in our country. It's shocking how much you don't see it today like you used to. I watched the other day um, a riot uh, in, uh, I think it was in Portland, where an Antifa young man took a baseball bat uh, and ran at a police officer and hit him in the head. It was a good thing that the officer had a helmet on. What was shocking was the young man posted it online and bragged about how exhilarating it was for him to express his anger in that fashion. And his mother was a politician, or had been. And she went online when they finally caught his son, their, their son, and she went online to say, he's a good boy. He's a straight-A student. And, and she was asking the judge to not make the, char in the, in the charges against him so austere because he was such a good boy. I'm thinking to myself, number one, where's the character of the young man? And then where's the character of the mother? I mean, I was raised in a law enforcement family. I, I got the drill from my dad. 
Didn't you? About how you, what happens if you get pulled over? Yes, sir. No, sir. You know, don't reach for stuff in your car. Don't move. Look straight ahead. You know, I exited the vehicle one time when I got pulled over. Don't ever do that. The officer's reaching for his pistols like, what are you doing? You know, uh, I'm like, I'm just coming back to talk to you. Mm -hmm. You know, I was taught to respect the police, to, to, to uh, admire them as, as individuals. Doesn't mean that they can't have issues and have problems. As the ch police chaplain of 1,300 officers before I came here, I've told you before, I'll be the first to tell you, they are not all perfect, but there's some great men and women. Res respect them. Um, but there's character that's, uh, that's missing in our culture. When a mother can come online and say, he's such a good boy. I, I, I don't know, is my mother here in this service? She's probably not. I think she's coming to... Is she in this service? Oh, where is she? I don't think she's in this service. So we could talk about my mother for just a minute. If I were to strike a police officer when I was like in high school with a baseball bat, I can tell you that my mom would not have been online talking about how great of a student I was. If she'd been online all right, give him everything that's coming to him. That would have been my mother. Uh, and so Paul, uh, David stops here and says, let's talk about the wicked and let's talk about the righteous. What is their character? Character counts greatly. God looks at your character and will judge accordingly. So well, let's look at it. The wicked, what is his character like? What does he do? He borrows with no intention of repaying. What's the righteous person like? Shows mercy and, and gives. Doesn't just show mercy. Oh, that's so bad. You're in that terrible situation. No, what can I do to help you? See, the contrast between a righteous person and an unrighteous person is, it boils down to this level, that, that God provides for you so that even in a wicked time, uh, God's looking at your character to say, how are you going to live? See, the wicked lives with, uh, hey, I need, I need some money. Have you ever loaned money to a family member? Have you done this? I I've been there. Uh, and, you know, hey, I'll, you know, I'll make the first payment. Don't worry. I'll make the second payment. I'll give you all the money back, etc. After one or two payments, you never hear from them again. You had this happen before? You know what I'm saying? You know, you, you loan to people who are, are godless, and it's like, well, you make more money than I do, and you just kind of like owe it to me. Are you kidding? He says the wicked they borrow with no intention of really giving it back to you. Uh, but, but what is it like for a righteous person? Well, so let's pause. The wicked person is about getting, not giving. It's give to me. And even more with socialism in our country on its rise, it's about, oh, we need to take from everybody else and give it to everybody else. It's a legalized form of theft. He says, know what a righteous person is like? Well, they're a giver, not a getter. Totally different. The righteous person uh, is known to be the opposite. But the righteous, they show mercy uh, and they give. Uh, the word give there is a Hebrew participle, which means it's a perpetual-like activity. They, they are known in their life as being a giver. Uh, we're approaching Thanksgiving. It's quickly approaching. It's, it's scary how fast this has happened. What happens in our church at Thanksgiving? We get together, and we have an awesome kitchen this year for it, uh, and hundreds of people descend on our church, and they, ba they, they make meals, turkeys, the whole fixings for uh, poor people in our community. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people will be fed because many of you will show up uh, and cook a turkey and bring all the fixings for them. Uh, and I've been down here and watching. It's, it's, a, it's unbelievable. See, because we're a church that understands in tough times, what does God look for? He looks for people that are givers, not takers. What does our world need to see but people that are giver, givers because they're merciful? Uh, one of our young ladies uh, passed away from cancer uh, a couple years ago, and as she was uh, in the process of dying, um, I went over to see her before she passed away to pray with her at her house in the hospital bed in the living room. And I went there, and every time I would go, there was some of our ladies always there with the hospice worker. And, and I've, you know, I've visited a lot of people in those kinds of situations before. The hospice worker told me this uh, uh, as I left that day. She, as I, I went over to the front door, the hospice lady wa walked over to me, and she said, I just wanted to tell you that in all my years of being a hospice worker, being with people when they die, I have never seen a church like this before. I go, what do you mean? She, I have never seen people in mass show up constantly to care for a dying mother like this. I've never seen this. This is amazing. See, what do we understand as a church? That in difficult times, God's looking for people that show mercy to those who need mercy, and they're givers, not takers. Which are you? Are you a giver? Or are you a, a, a getter? 
Uh, those who give uh, will inherit the kingdom, according to verse 22. It says, Bless, uh, for those uh, blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. See, God doesn't have t- tolerance for those who live contrary to his ways. He says, if you live as a, as a person who shows this character that flows from Christ, uh, that when the kingdom shows up, you'll inherit the earth. It's kind of ironic. The very thing that the godless want to establish is their version of utopia on earth, but it's really a dystopia because it's not founded on truth. But the very thing that they want, they're going to lose. And who does God give the, the kingdom to, the planet, when he refashions the earth and sets himself up, up as king in Jerusalem? He gives it to the, well, to the meek, to the givers, to the humble. It's a divine promise. God also promises to protect you in the meantime. He says in verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way. Uh, the Lord delights in the way of a righteous person. He says a, a man that's godly has steps that are ordered by God. Uh, this, the word to be ordered here in the Hebrew uh, talks about your lifestyle of following after God's principles. Uh, Psalm 17, 4 tells us uh, similar wording. says this, Concerning the works of man, by the word of your lips, I, the psalmist says, have kept uh, away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my, pa- uh, uphold my steps in your paths that my footsteps may not slip. Translate into our vernacular. God, I want to know your word, and I want to live your word in my godless day so that I will not slip and, and fall uh, in, in my moral life. He says that the steps of a good man are ordered by God. He's not talking about predetermined life. No, he's talking about God has told you as a godly man, live this way. Uh, and, and I will bless your life. And a godly person studies that and doesn't chafe against it, but says, God, I want to align myself with what you say I should do. We live in a day where people want to uh, change God's law, change moral law to that which is immoral, and then call that moral. God, God tells us here that uh, the godly person understands that uh, God's word uh, does not change. But we are people with clay feet. So we have three things from God. Let's review. What do we have from God? We have promise that he's going to be there, provision when we're walking through life, no matter what happens, and protection. Notice what he says in verse 20, 24. Though he, the Christian, do what? Though he do what? Fall. He will not utterly be cast down. Why? Well, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. It's a beautiful imagery. Though he fall, which God's a, very, a pragmatist. He knows that we're made of, uh, of clay, that we have uh, feet made of clay, that we have chinks in our armor, that we are going to have opportunities where we give in to a temptation and we, and we sin and we fall. Is it over for you then? No, no. He says, remember, I have a, I'm going to give you a, a promise that, that when you fall, because you're going to fall, and when you fall, don't think that God is done with you. Because he says, when you fall, you're not going to be utterly cast down. It's not utterly over for you. Why? Because God's going to reach down when you're on the ground, and he's going to reach down and say, here, grab my hand. Let let me pick you up. What does the devil say when you fall? Raspy voice comes to you and tells you, you're nothing. You're not worth anything. You always knew this was going to happen. You couldn't stop this from happening. You're going to do it again. He's always whispering this stuff in your ear. He's very condemning. See, the, spirit, the difference between the spirit of God and the devil, his voice, is the devil condemns, but the spirit convicts. Amen. See, the spirit convicts and you repent and move to holiness. The devil just conv- condemns you and you feel terrible. He says, though you fall, I'm going to be there for you. Remember when, uh, when Peter deni- denied Christ how many times? Three. Three times. You know, I've stood on that hillside in Israel just back in February. George, you were there with us, where there's a big statue of Peter with a, with a rooster in the background, and you're standing there overlooking the Temple Mount and the Kidron Valley down below. And in this area uh, where the house was of the priest, where, where Peter denied the Christ, I mean, you can imagine, you denied Jesus? I mean, you deserted your friend at the most pivotal hour of his life? He did. But then he, he fell big time, did he not? But notice how Jesus responds uh, to Peter in John 21 after Jesus is resurrected. He comes to Peter, and instead of castigating him, what does he say? He asks him three times, do you love me? Using different Greek words for love. Do you, do you love me as a friend? You know, down to, do you have divine love for me? I mean, an abiding love for me? Peter, do you even love me? But notice what he says here. He says to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonan, do you love me? 
even though you blew it and fell, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, what? You're a loser. It's over for you. I'm done with you. What did he tell him to do? Go feed my sheep. Go be a shepherd. I'm not done with you. See, this is Psalm 37. In a wicked time when the devil crucifies the Messiah, but the Messiah is resurrected, the Messiah comes to Jesus as the good shepherd and said, Peter, you fell down three times flat on your face, but I'm here to extend my hand to you. I know you love me, and I'm here. You might be Peter today. You have fallen down three times, and you think it's over. What does Jesus tell you in dark days? I don't forget, my hand is extended to you. Just reach for it. Reach for it. Uh, what kind of uh, people should we be? Uh, those who understand as we get old how God operates. Verse 25, David says, as I reflect back on life, he says, I've been, I've been young, and now I'm old. I'm thinking old is probably 90 plus, wouldn't you say? Uh, it's getting, I'm pushing it down further as I go along. Yeah. I was in line uh, yesterday with uh, my wife and my mom and Liz, and, uh, oh, no, it's when I was voting. Yeah, it's when I was voting. Uh, and we were, you know, handing them our ID cards. And so the guy checked in my mom. He checked in Liz. Then he checked in me. And so when he asked for my, my cards, he's looking at Liz, who just turned her card in. And he looks at me, and he goes, uh, uh, could I have your father's card? <laughs> <laughs> huh? Are you kidding me? <sighs> it's a good thing I'm saved, isn't it? Good thing there's plexiglass protecting you, buddy. Um, oh my God, and this was a guy with dyed black hair. Even his scalp is dyed black. And I'm like, at least I'm going with the gray, you know? So David says, hey, let me reflect on my life. I've been young, now I'm old. What do I know? What does he know? Well, I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. Translated, remember you got three things from God. What do you have? You have promises from God, you have provisions from God, and you got protection from God. You know, but David says, I look back in life, I mean, I see that God is there for those three things I've mentioned. Now, this is a truism. Does it mean that it's true at all times and all places? No. It is generally true. I mean, think about David's life. There was a tension in his life. Uh, when he blew it with Bathsheba, remember how that happened? Adultery, you know, the whole, it killed her husband, murder, etc. cetera. Um, did God forsake David then? No. So did David experience discipline for his sin? Answer, yes. But God did not forsake him. Uh, when David and his men were fleeing Saul and his men, his warriors, were hungry, uh, and they show up at the tabernacle, uh, this is not the place you pull in for, uh, you know, a drive through window of some food. It's the tabernacle. There's food in there on the table of showbread, 12 loaves of bread. Uh, Ahimelech, uh, the, the priest that day, uh, 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6, gives the table of showbread food to David, and David eats it. Jesus later talks about this in the Gospels. It's amazing. So, you know, even when he was in a terrible situation and hungry, uh, God approved of him eating the, the holy bread. The sh the show God provided for him. Uh, God, God did not forsake David when he sinned with Bathsheba, when he showed up at the tabernacle needing food. God never forsook, forsook him. So no matter what your situation is, uh, God will not forsake you either. He will always be there in ways that you cannot even begin to comprehend, no matter what happens. Whether you're uh, taken uh, as a prisoner by uh, uh, you know, a terrorist group or whatever happens, you can always say that even in the, the stillness of the moment, wherever you are, that even in this, God is with me. Even this. Paul and Silas uh, were arrested uh, for their uh, preaching of Christ. Uh, and Imagine being, pre being arrested because you're so effective with the gospel. Imagine. In Acts 16, they're thrown in jail uh, and eventually God then sees them in jail and sends an angel to deliver them. So God says, even in, even in prison, I can open the doors if I want to. Here's an angel to open the doors for you. But when, when Paul looks back at his life and reflects on his life, notice what he says in 2 Corinthians 11. He says, are, are they ministers of Christ? I, said, I speak as a fool. He says, I am more. Uh, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I've received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And on and on he goes. But do you think Paul ever looked at his life and all that he experienced? 
shipwrecked and all the things he went through. Do you think he ever looked at his life and said, oh, God has forsaken me? No. He says, as I look back at my life, there's a tension between great moments of blessing and great moments of, of tough times. But in all of that, uh, I have never seen the righteous forsaken. And God always provided for me. Because you have God's promise. Verse, uh, verse uh, 27 tells us, or verses 26 and 27 tell us how we should live uh, in, in light of the fact that God will not forsake us. In verse 26, it says that uh, he is ever merciful, uh, the godly person, and he lends, and his descendants are then blessed. See, if you are a person who understands that God will be with you no matter what, he goes back to the motif of you're a giver, not a getter. He says, this is how you know a truly godly person. Their hand is open. Their heart's full of mercy. Uh, and they're one who, who, who is merciful and they lend. Do you have tools that you lend out that you never see again? I've got books I don't know. I've, God took them. I gave them to people and I've never seen them again. Um, but if you're a godly person, you, you lend to those who are in need. And the result is your life is blessed. He says your descendants are blessed. So if you're a dad or you're a mom or you're a grandma or a grandpa, whoever you are, high school student, whoever you are, and you're a godly person who gives to those around you that have needs, God blesses your descendants. And does he tell you how he's going to bless them? No. Because isn't that exciting? Because God doesn't say specifically I'm going to do X. No, he leaves it wide open. So the God of the cosmos can look down at your life and say, you're such a giver. I'm going to make sure that I, I bless your life in profound ways. You know, my mom and my dad were both givers, and my mom still is, and now that my dad's gone, givers. And my life has been a result of their openness toward others. You know, I no sooner went to college than, than there were young guys living in our house. When I came home to San Diego from LA, I'm like, who are these people? Well, I met him at Denny's, and he's led a rough life, and he needed a break, and met this person here, and he needed a break. And all, these young guys living in my parents' house. Uh, being, uh, giving toward them. And I get blessed from that because it teaches me about the provision of God and how I should live. How else should I live is, in addition to being a giver, verse 27 says, I should constantly be thinking about doing what? Departing from evil. See, when our world runs to evil and embraces it and calls it good, uh, David says, if you're godly in godless times, you should depart from evil and do good. Don't just talk about good, do it. And dwell forevermore. For the Lord loves justice, and he does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell forever. All throughout this passage, he says, the godly people are going to inherit the kingdom when it comes. So live like a godly person in a godless day. How do you do that? If there's evil in my life, and I know what it is, I, I drop it. I walk away from it. And if you don't know what your evil is, just ask God today. Because you can't work in the yard today, correct? You got to spend some time going down in the basement, find a nice quiet place, sit down in a chair, and just say, Dear Lord, show me what my evil is that I might confess it and depart from that. And He's going to show you in short order. See, this is what our world needs is, is people that have a great character that's godly. You know, it's hard to argue with a godly character, it's the ultimate apologetic. That a life, a changed life, Amy Barrett being considered for what? Supreme Court. Doesn't she have a stellar godly character? Indeed she does. It's hard to argue with her life, is it not? I mean, what has she done? She's adopted children from, is it Haiti? Two children when she already had children. Uh, the one young blind lady that spoke about how great she was a as a professor because this is the young, the young professor that came alongside a blind girl to help her become a great student. I mean, when we listened to that young blind lady talk the other day, Liz said, I cannot believe how articulate that young lady is. Why? Because a godly person poured their life into her. See, this is what you see when you think about uh, how we reach our culture. We reach our culture by living for Christ and, and having a character that exudes Christ. You know, God has given us three things. He's given us promises, provisions, and protection. He says in verse 30, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. His tongue talks of justice. The law of God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. Translated, if you're a godly person, you'll know the word of God and you'll live it and you'll walk through life and not trip up in major ways because you know God's word. Is that you? Verse 32 says, expect as you watch your life closely, and live for God. Expect for the wicked not to be happy. Verse 
32. God says, uh, the wicked, they do what? They watch you. They watch the righteous. Why? Well, they seek to slay you. Either physically take you out, verbally take you out, some way to silence you. Why? Well, because your lifestyle bothers them. Your words bother them because your words are truth. Um, I worked on a longshoreman dock when I was in college, loading railroad cars. I seen them down uh, as a cantaloupe, cantaloupe plant. Uh, I chose those kinds of jobs because I could be around really godless people. Um, and trust me, they, once they found out I was a Christian and going to school to get a degree in theology, they, uh, they constantly badgered me to do what they did. Constantly, all day long and at night when we worked. They watched my life and were constantly offering me stuff that they were smoking, drinking, dropping, whatever, so that I could become one of them. And it just, it just drove them crazy. Uh, and the guy that I worked with, his name was Larry, before we would come to work, he would drop acid. And we worked around moving railroad cars. You know, those kinds of guys. And God says, the, the wicked will watch you and figure out a way to silence you. I've experienced that my whole life. But it should not make you throw in the towel. He says, they will study you. They will, they will seek to silence you, but, but you stand your ground. Why? Look at verse 33. The Lord will not leave him in his hand, nor condemn him when he's judged. What's that mean? God's not going to leave you in the hand of the wicked where they consume you. No, he's going to be with you. So even if they drug you into court on trumped up charges, God in his courtroom will say to all the angels and all the saints of heaven, they might hive him in an earthly court, but he's guiltless. Because one day when the Lord returns and judges all, he can look at that saint and say, no, you, you were never guilty in my eyes. See, I, I don't know about you. I would rather be the person who stands in God's sight as guiltless than to worry about what man might, man might levy against me. Jesus uh, tells us in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, he says, but I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, they will give account on this in the day of judgment. For, your, for by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. See, when you're brought into God's courtroom, he has all the facts. And if you want to sit and argue with him, as he says they will in Matthew 7, he'll just roll the tape. He's got the video. I mean, he, he's got the audio. He's got everything. He brings you into judgment, and he says, uh, okay, well, let's uh, see, if you're, uh, see if you're right or wrong before I judge you. The saint will stand there and say, hey, I'm, my life's covered by the blood of Christ. I, I'm, I'm, I'm guiltless. I'm guiltless. David reminds us of how to live and says, be mindful that even though drug into a court of law before God, your motives were clear. You were living for me. I know the facts. I don't, I don't say that you're guilty. Verse 35, David says, when I look around at the world around me, I, I've lived to see that the, I've seen wicked in great power, he says in verse 35. Uh, they spread themselves out like a native green tree. Have you ever seen this? that the wicked rise to a position in an office, at a company, at wherever it is that you are, on a team, wherever it is, and all of a sudden, they're, they're just like pervasive in what they do, and there's all kinds of problems that they cause, and, and they, there's opposition created, and angst, and all kinds of things going on as they spread out like a green tree. He said, I've lived to watch that happen. I've lived to watch that happen. He says in verse 36, but you, when you see this happen, God gives you a promise. What's the promise? Yet he, the godless person that's pervasive in their power, is passed away. And behold, he was no more. Indeed, I sought him, David said. I couldn't even find that guy anymore. Because within time, as you get older, and you look back to all the people in your life that did wicked things and had great power, where are they now? God removes them. God removes them. Think of all the people that thought they were all of that as politicians. Nebuchadnezzar, most powerful king on the planet. God humbled him. Pharaoh of the Exodus, when old men Moses and Aaron went into his presence and said, God has a simple message, let my people go. Uh, and, and Pharaoh's like, that's not happening. What'd God do? God humbled Pharaoh. Uh, Pilate stood before Jesus, God himself, and thought he was more powerful than Jesus. And in, in John 19, here's what we read. Therefore, when Pilate heard that saying of who Jesus was, he was more afraid. And he went again into the praetorium and he said to Jesus, uh, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then Pilate said to him, 
Are you not speaking to me? Do, do you not know that I have power to crucify you and power to release you? Jesus answered and says, this is profound. You could have no power at all against me if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who delivered me to you uh, has the greater sin. Translated, I'm only here because my father put me here, not because you put me here. And you think you have all power? No, my father has all power. See, Jesus has the proper perspective on life that even when they tried to silence him, he knew that God was with him. What kind of person should you be as we head into deeper, darker days? Verse 37 tells you, mark the blameless man. Observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace, but transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked, it will be cut off. He says, if you're walking through a godless day, pay attention to super godly people. Mark them. What's a blameless person? A person you can study their life and you can't find dirt on him. You just can't find dirt on him because they're God. He says, mark that person and then get alongside them and may they be a stake on your tree when the wind blows. That's what he's telling you. How many blameless people are in your life? Uh, I have many blameless people in my life uh, because you need them in, in tough times. David's closing counsel in this great chapter is, uh, focuses on uh, the three things that we talked about. It says, but salvation of the righteous is from who? The Lord, the Lord. That is his promise, his salvation. It comes from him. He is the strength in a time of trouble. Translated, he's your provision. And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust him. That's God's protection. You have three things from God in dark days. You have what? Divine promise. You have divine protection and divine provision. Uh, when I was in California, I taught... Uh, Old Testament on Monday nights at the largest Russian church in, the, in, in California. Uh, Theodore Karpiak, a, a pastor, was an 80-year-old pastor who had defected in the 60s, was my translator. I taught basically Russian soldiers. Is, that's who was in the class. Um, they didn't speak uh, English, and I didn't speak Russian. That's why I had Theodore there. There was a guy in the back of the class. His name was Nikolai. Uh, Nikolai was about my age. But he had spent seven years in a Russian prison. And I asked him through the interpreter, why did they throw you in prison? He said, I watched the KGB burn a church down one day. And I went down the street and took one picture. And somebody saw me and turned me into the KGB. You did seven years in a cell by yourself for one photo? He said, yeah. And he said, every day the soldiers would come into the, the block where he was and fire pistols in rooms around him. He said, for seven years, I never knew if they shot somebody or if I was next. But when you stood next to Nikolai, you were next to a, a really stout little Russian man who had a heart for God. There was no bitterness, no anger, just a deep abiding love of Christ. Why? Because Nikolai knew three things. He had in that cell, God's promise, God's provision even in there, and God's protection that Nikolai, I'm not going to desert you. His name in uh, Greek means to be a conqueror, and indeed he is. May we be like a Nikolai to our culture. Let's pray. God, thank you for the clarity of David's pen. Uh, so hard sometimes to live like we know we should. We compromise. May we not. May we do what David says we are to do and to remember how great you are in tough times, evil days. And may the godless look at our lives, see them blameless, and want to know who it is that we know, how is it that we are how we are, so they might turn to Christ as well. May our lives be a shining example of Jesus to those about us. In Christ's name, amen.